For me, it's no wonder why we have the sickest population on the planet. Everything we do is disrupting nitric oxide production. If you can't make nitric oxide, you're going to develop chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, chronic fatigue. If you use mouthwash, you kill the nitrate reducing bacteria and you now you don't get the benefits of eating a good diet. So this is really the canary in the coal mine and it should be a warning signal for people that have erectile dysfunction that, hey, this isn't just a sexual problem. This isn't just a testosterone problem or an estrogen problem in women. This is a vascular problem insufficient nitric oxide production, and it's systemic. What is nitric oxide and why does it matter for our health? Well, thanks, Jesse. It's, it's great to be with you. And that's a look, that's a very important question. And really one we've been trying to answer for the past 30 years. But today we know that nitric oxide is a signaling molecule. It's produced in the body naturally. Uh, the older we get, the less we make. And that's what's responsible for age-related disease. But it really, at its basis, it's uh, it tells our blood vessels to relax and dilate. So it improves oxygen delivery, improves blood flow, inhibits inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction, the key hallmarks of every single chronic disease. So now we understand how the human body makes nitric oxide, what goes wrong in people that can't make it, and now we know how to fix it. All right. Well, let's start talking about what happens when the body isn't making it correctly. I know there's two different pathways, so let's take each one and get into the nuance there. So about, I guess probably been 30, 35 years ago, it was first recognized that there's an enzyme in the lining of the blood vessel called nitric oxide synthase. And that enzyme converts L-arginine, which is an amino acid, into nitric oxide. So that was the first pathway to be discovered. Now, I just want to make a point that the first pathway to be discovered doesn't necessarily mean it's the most important or prominent. It was just the first to be discovered. So this enzyme converts arginine to nitric oxide and you get citrulline as a byproduct. And it's the second to second production of nitric oxide that regulates the second to second blood flow and oxygen delivery to every organ, tissue, and cell in the body. And it's the dysfunction of that enzyme, and we call that endothelial dysfunction. So the older we get, the less nitric oxide we make. We call that endothelial dysfunction. We have decreased blood flow, uh, decreased oxygen delivery to every cell in the body. Then we have inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. So that's the first pathway. It's very well elucidated. We know the enzymology, the biochemistry of that pathway. We know what goes wrong in people that can't make it, and we know how to fix it. Now, the other path... All right, before we jump into number two, I want to I wanna pause here and take some time and get into the subtleties there. So arginine is the amino acid you mentioned that is the first step of this pathway. We know that as we get older, this doesn't work as well. Talk about where the arginine comes from. If it's an amino acid, I assume the diet. And then let's get into where things go awry and why as we age, does this not work as well? Now, it's a fundamental question if you want to understand chronic disease and keep from getting chronic disease. So L-arginine is a substrate that this enzyme uses to make nitric oxide. And it's a semi-essential amino acid. Semi-essential meaning that you get part of it from your diet. So the breakdown of proteins, proteins are made up of individual amino acids. Arginine is a common constituent of most proteins. And then it's also made through the urea cycle. So the human body makes arginine on its own. So even if you're not getting enough from your diet, you make enough through the urea cycle to theoretically saturate the enzyme to make nitric oxide. So this whole concept of supplementation of L-arginine has never made sense to me biochemically because there's never a condition where patients or sick people are deficient in arginine. So it doesn't make sense to give the body more. In fact, we now know that if you give the body more, it can actually do more harm than good. Uh, so the body makes enough L-arginine to where you don't have to supplement. If you supplement, there's at least two clinical trials showing that actually patients get worse. Post-infarct patients, meaning people who've just had a heart attack, in 2006, they published a study that the people who were getting high-dose arginine actually had a greater mortality. It was killing more people than the placebo. And then a similar study in, I think, 2011 in patients with peripheral artery disease, give them high-dose L-arginine, they got worse. So we knew, we've, we've known for many, many decades now that arginine is not the solution for nitric oxide deficiency. In fact, it can be counterproductive uh, and cause more harm. So what happens, and the reason people become nitric oxide deficient, is the enzyme that converts arginine to nitric oxide becomes uncoupled. 
So there's a, there's a flow of electrons through this enzyme. You have many different cofactors and substrates. And when this enzyme becomes uncoupled, then it can't transport this flow of electrons to the five electron oxidation of arginine and production of nitric oxide. So we, now we know what causes enzyme uncoupling. It's the oxidation of tetrahydrobopterin. We, we provide a certain redox potential or an electric potential to prevent the oxidation of BH4. You recouple the enzyme, and now we can improve endogenous nitric oxide production without the need for supplemental arginine or citrulline or anything like that. So that's the basic biochemistry of that pathway. Okay, there's a lot in there I want to unpack. So we know that the substrate arginine isn't the rate limiting part of this whole thing. We know that actually if we take in too much, it can cause problems. I'm curious, in those studies where they did find there was problems where people were taking that, what was the physiology there? Well, when you when you have an uncoupled nitric oxide synthase enzyme and you give high-dose arginine, this enzyme actually produces superoxide, which is an oxygen radical, and causes more damage, causes increased inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. So the patients got worse. The other problem we worry about is if you give high-dose arginine, you know, the body has enormous redundancy in it, and it only it regulates what it needs in certain pathways. So if you give high-dose arginine, you get an increase in expression of an enzyme called arginase, and then you divert the arginine, which would normally go through the nitric oxide pathway, away from the nitric oxide pathway and through ornithine and urea disposal. So you can actually divert and, and basically have unintended consequences of what you're trying to achieve by giving high-dose arginine. So I tell people, arginine is not your problem, or it can be your problem. If you're using arginine-based supplements, uh, save your money, uh, save your health. You don't need them. In fact, if you don't know what you're doing, it can cause more harm. Okay, so let's focus in now on the enzyme. So we have this enzyme in the endothelium. It becomes uncoupled, and this is where the issue is. Is this just something that happens naturally? It sounds like it is, but is this just something that happens naturally as we age? Or are there certain things that we can do to slow that down? Or are there things we're doing that are speeding that up that we can control? All of the above. <laughs> so if you look at population-based kind of studies, what we see is we lose about 10 to 12% of the function of that enzyme per decade. So really by the time you're 40 or 50 years old, you only have about 50% of that function of that enzyme that you had when you were 20. Now we know that that's not that doesn't have to be the case, right? So I'll be 50 in a couple of months, but I have a biological age of a 38-year-old. And we know we have 18, 20-year-old kids who have the biological age and the vascular age of a 50, 60-year-old. They have severe endothelial dysfunction. So we can now modulate the activity of this enzyme. So the rate-limiting step is, is oxidation or oxidative stress. So because we live in a toxic world, we're exposed to EMF, we're exposed to herbicides, pesticides, we're exposed to a Western diet, poor diet, processed foods, a lot of sugar. All of those conditions lead to NOS uncoupling and nitric oxide deficiency. But if we take into account and eat an anti-inflammatory diet, if we get regular moderate physical exercise, if we're exposed to sunlight, you know, 20 or 30 minutes a day, all these things facilitate and we take antioxidants to prevent oxidative stress, then we can preserve the function of this enzyme and prevent this age-related decline in nitric oxide production. And to me, that's the holy grail in cardiovascular medicine and really health and longevity. Okay, so there's these different lifestyle factors, you named a bunch of them, where we can prolong at least the degradation of the uncoupling of that enzyme. And food was part of that. And this is where it gets a little bit more complex. There's a second pathway that involves certain foods where we can boost NO. So let's bring the second pathway in now, and then we're going to tie all this together. Yeah, that's really the remarkable thing about human physiology. And I'm always intrigued by how the human body works. So we've known for centuries, right? Diet and exercise is essential for health and well-being and longevity. But come to find out, about 20, 25 years ago, we discovered a pathway whereby the mechanism of certain diets, like a Japanese diet, a plant-based diet, Mediterranean diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, all of these diets that through epidemiological evidence have been shown to reduce blood pressure, reduce cancer rates, improve longevity and, and lifespan. The mechanism of those diets revolves around a molecule called inorganic nitrate. And this is a molecule found primarily in green leafy vegetables 
things like beets, arugula, spinach, kale, the darker the green leafy vegetable, typically the, the higher the nitrate content. Well, when we consume these vegetables, about 90 minutes after we consume them, the nitrate is taken up in the gut, it's concentrated in our salivary glands, and now for the next 6, 8, 10 hours, each time we salivate, we're secreting nitrate. And if we have the right oral bacteria in our mouth, the, nit the bacteria reduce nitrate to nitrite and nitric oxide. So this is the first metabolic activation step of the diet. So we're 100% dependent upon the bacteria that live in and on our body to activate nitrate so that the body can utilize it to make nitric oxide. And now our saliva becomes enriched in nitrite. So when we swallow our own saliva, we get a burst of nitric oxide gas in the stomach. And that nitric oxide from swallowing our own saliva kills things like H. pylori, the ulcer-causing bacteria, E. coli, salmonella, clostridium. So if you've got a, a bacteria on the foods or the lettuce or the spinach or vegetables you're eating, then it kills it through normal uh, nitric oxide production in the lumen of the stomach. So you, you may have caught three important points there. Number one, we need enough nitrate from our diet. Number two, we have to have the right bacteria. And number three, we have to have sufficient stomach acid production. And this is where Americans get it completely wrong, right? And we've quantified this. We know the standard American diet doesn't contain enough nitrate to fuel this pathway. Two out of three Americans wake up every morning and use mouthwash, killing the oral microbiome, shutting down nitric oxide production. And there are 200 million prescriptions written for antacids every year. And that's not even counting the over-the-counter purchases. You can get Prilosec, Prevacid, Nexium, all these over-the-counter products. And people have been on these antacids for, you know, 5, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. And this completely shuts down nitric oxide production. So it's just the, the American lifestyle. It seems like every, every part of the American lifestyle leads to a decrease in nitric oxide production. So for me, it's no wonder why we have the sickest population on the planet. Everything we do is disrupting nitric oxide production. If you can't make nitric oxide, you're going to develop chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, chronic fatigue. Uh, it's what Americans are faced with today, most Americans. All right. A lot in there, Tunpak. I'm going to try and summarize a little bit here for us. So we take in nitrates through the diet, dark leafy greens, best source. The, the bacteria in the mouth are going to convert nitrates to nitrites. And this happens as the food is passing over our tongue. Also, as we take in the nitrates, there's a, a pathway in our body that recycles them all the way back through the saliva onto the tongue again. So there's the two different ways that that happens. Then we need the stomach acid when we swallow that saliva to turn the nitrite into nitric oxide. Do I have that right? You got it. Well, let's start with there's these three pieces that we need to be cognizant of and need to make sure we're optimizing. You mentioned them there, and I want to get into each of the three and make sure that we know how to do that. Starting with the dietary piece. We know, again, leafy greens, this is where we're going to get our nitrates. Let's talk about the absolute top sources in that category and then what we're looking for because, for example, I know spinach is, is a good source or beets, which beets is a little bit different, not obviously part of the leafy greens, but there are different factors as we're growing these and such that can influence how much nitrate are in the produce. So let's really pick this apart. We, you know, we, we, we attempted to answer, I think the question you're trying to pose is if we wanted to use diet as a first-line defense for preventing nitric oxide deficiency, how much spinach, celery, broccoli, kale, arugula would you need to eat to reach that threshold of nitrate so the body can convert it to nitric oxide? And so to answer that question, in collaboration with Texas A&M University, we went to five cities across the U.S. and we just took vegetables off the shelf, we brought it back to the lab, and we analyzed it for the nitrate content. And we went to Raleigh, New York, Chicago, Dallas, and Los Angeles, kind of five corners of the U.S. And what we found was, you know, it was really pretty shocking to us. We, we figured there would be some variability, but, you know, there's as much as a 50 to 80-fold difference in the nitrate content of vegetables bought and grown in New York compared to those bought and grown in Los Angeles or Dallas. So then when we uncovered this a little bit more, we realized, well, there's different farming practices uh, on different parts of the U.S. There's different soil conditions, certainly different climate conditions. 
And then we realize there's a certain number of lightning storms in these different areas. And so nitrogen is fixed in the form of nitrate primarily through lightning storms. So to break the triple bond of nitrogen, you need high energy. And really that only occurs through lightning. So we're finding that in areas kind of in the, the rust belt of the south where there's a lot of thunderstorms, the soil seems to have more nitrate in it. And then other regions, for, for whatever reason, they may not. And then the other shocking thing, so the point of that is we really couldn't make any recommendations on how many servings of a given vegetable you would need to eat because it depends on where it was grown, what the end, what vegetable it was, because there's regional difference, then there's high variability from, you know, celery, broccoli, kale, spinach, across vegetable categories. And then we did something a little bit on top of that. We took organically grown vegetables. So ve these are vegetables that have an organic label. And then we compared those to conventionally grown vegetables. And on average, the, the organic vegetables had about 10 times less nitrate across the board. And now when you, you got to think about that for a minute, because most people think organic is good. I should eat organic. But from our studies, if you're eating only organic, you become nitrate deficient. And I think perhaps more importantly, you need nitrogen in the form of nitrate to assimilate other minerals and nutrients. So if a vegetable is deficient in nitrogen or nitrate, it's not going to assimilate other nutrients. So now these vegetables are deficient in things like magnesium, chromium, selenium, all the trace minerals and vitamins and nutrients that we used to get. So I tell people you, it's really difficult to eat enough organic vegetables to get enough nitrate in your diet to stimulate this nitric oxide production pathway. And organic means that, one, no herbicides, no pesticides, but there's a restriction on nitrogen-based fertilizers added to the soil in organically grown vegetables. So for instance, what I do when I grow my vegetables, we, we raise our own beef, we grow our own vegetables, but I, so, I sample the soil and send it off and for analysis to figure what's missing in the soil, what do I need to supplement? And then I add standardized nitrogen to the soil. So I know that my soil is enriched in nitrogen. So the vegetables that I'm eating and that I'm growing here in my own ranch they wouldn't be classified as organic because I'm adding fertilizers, but I'm not adding herbicides or pesticides. So I think there's a fine balance here. And I think people are so caught up in this whole concept of organic and they really don't know what in the hell organic means. They've been taught by the media that it's, you know, it's good, it's healthy. Well, I think it's free of herbicides and pesticides, but we now know that the vegetables grown in the U.S. since 1940s have about a 78% less vitamins and minerals and nutrients uh, since the 1940s. So the pressures of feeding a growing planet population is at the expense of nutrient density. Let me just pause you right there because there's a lot I want to get into within what you've just shared. So we know that in general, organic has less nitrate. So, and you explain the whole nitrogen being added to the soil and the reason for that. You mentioned the fact that you're growing your own food so you can add that back in and not add the poisons. What do you recommend to people then if they're not able to grow their own food, they don't have, you know, the time, the land, whatever it is, and they're they're buying from a grocery store and up till this point they've been buying organic, can we just make up, and there's another piece to this I want to make sure and tease out, and this is something I haven't heard you talk about before. I think the part about the nitrate not being in the soil is easy enough to understand, but you mentioned the fact that it affects the different nutrients beyond the nitrate. So I know I threw a lot at you. I want to understand that second part where it's affecting more than just the nitrate. And then also on top of that, for somebody who isn't going to grow their own food, what's the best they can do? Yeah, you know, there's the whole field of agronomy on how do you maximize product yield and nutrient density. And so go back 100 years ago, you know, farmers used to do crop rotation. So they would grow crops that would deplete certain minerals and nutrients from the field, then they would go back and plant, let's say, soybean or clover or some vegetable that would replete those nutrients back in the soil. So crop rotation allowed for fertile grounds. Now you see these fields that are just, all they do is, is grow coin, all they do is grow soybean or, or a cotton. So there is no crop rotation. So we have to assimilate nutrients in the plants that we grow, and you do that through nitrogen and, and nitrogen assimilation in the form of nitrate. So if the soil is deficient in nitrate, it's most likely going to be deficient in other trace minerals and nutrients. But more importantly, 
is, and you can see this, fertilized versus unfertilized uh, vegetables. The fertilized are really dark green. They have higher yield. The unfertilized is a light green, less nutrient, less yield. So in the organic world, you know, you can add manures, you can add organic compost. But again, there's so much variability in there. There's no standardization of the nitrogen. So you don't even know what you're getting in from. In fact, the manure, the compost may not have any nitrogen in it. So what I tell people is buy local. You know, go to your local farmer's market, talk to your local farmers, support the local growers, and then ask them questions. Say, hey, here's what I'm interested in. And, you know, people who live in really urban areas and inner cities, you know, it's very difficult. So then really the only solution for them is they've got to do what I call a micronutrient analysis. You can go get your blood tested and figure out exactly what, what are you deficient in. And then you can start to develop kind of some personalized supplementation. You know, we know just broadly from the NHANES study from the U.S. government that 75% of Americans don't get enough magnesium. 95% of Americans are deficient in iodine. 65, 75% are deficient in chromium, um, selenium, these trace minerals. And this is what causing a lot of chronic disease. You know, Linus Pauling said, you know, famously 50, 60 years ago that most chronic diseases are caused by nutrient deficiencies. If we don't have these trace minerals and nutrients, then the body can't do what it's designed to do and you become dysfunctional and you get sick. So it's it's a very it's a very interesting question, but it's the solution isn't very simple, right? So you have to be resourceful. But I think the simple thing is buy local from your local farmers market and then ask these farmers questions. How are you growing your foods? How are these vegetables? Do you add herbicides, pesticides? Uh, I certainly don't want that in my food supply, but we also I also want nutrients directly from the source. Okay. So the part I'm still a little fuzzy on, the fact that the other nutrients are low in the organic as well, is that just because when they add the fertilizer, they're adding other things to the soil and upping those nutrients? So I get the fact that the nitrogen isn't being added and that's where the nitrate is lower. But is there something to the other nutrients and why they're lower in the organic as well? Well, to, I'll give you an example. So when I fertilize my my land, I get nitrogen, I get potash, uh, get potassium and sulfur. So there's, there's a four kind of four main elements that we're adding to the soil. So nitrogen in the form of nitrate, uh, and you get potash. And so I use a, a mix because the soil samples tell me this is what I need for this type of land that I, I live on and grow in. So I know, for instance, it's 28% nitrogen, 14%, uh, 14, 7, and then 3.5% sulfur. So I'm putting all these nutrients in the soil so that now the plant has a way and the nutrients it needs, kind of like the human body, the plant now has what it needs to assimilate, transport all the other nutrients in the soil, provided those nutrients are in the soil. But if you don't test your soil and they're deficient in certain things, then the plants can't assimilate it because it's not available. And I think that's why soil sampling is so important. So you know exactly what's in your soil or what's not in your soil. And then you can put in there so that you have a nutrient dense food that you're growing in that soil. So it's, it's a matter of availability and just not knowing. But it's also important because even if you have those nutrients in the soil, without nitrogen in the form of nitrate, you don't assemble or transport those nutrients and assimilate them into the vegetable or the plant. That latter part is what I was trying to clarify. So that's great. So we know that when we're growing produce in different areas of the country, we're going to have different amounts of nitrogen. We know organic versus conventional is going to have a different amount. I took you on a tangent there. So continue your thought process when it comes to nitrates in the produce. So I guess the point I was trying to make is that this, and we've, we've, we've quantified this. So we took a standard American diet, just what most Americans would eat. And we grind it up and we quantify the nitrate content. And Americans are only getting about 150 milligrams of nitrate per day through normal dietary patterns. And we need at least a 300 milligrams to see any trickle of nitric oxide production because the inefficiencies of conversion. So number one, we're not getting enough nitrate. Uh, and then number two, those that eat a plant-based diet, they're not even guaranteed to get enough nitrate because depending on where they live, what vegetables they're eating, organic versus conventional, you may not even getting enough nitrate to reap the benefits of a plant-based diet. 
So if we took kind of the best case scenario, and so we published on this, we took a Japanese diet, we took a Mediterranean diet, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, and we just took food choices from those dietary patterns, and we quantified the nitrate that one eating those diets would, would consume over a period of a day. And we see anywhere in those diets from, you know, 400 milligrams up to 1500 milligrams in a Japanese diet of nitrate. So now what you're getting is you're getting sufficient nitric oxide being produced from those diets, provided you have the right bacteria and you can make stomach acid. So that, that kind of follows step one. The problem is we're not getting enough nitrate from our diet because of the, the variability in, in vegetables and regional growing techniques and organic versus conventional. Number two, and we stumbled upon this probably 20 years ago, if you use mouthwash, you kill the nitrate reducing bacteria and you now you don't get the benefits of eating a good diet. And think about this. I mean, people, people mostly have good intentions, right? They try to learn as much as they can. They try to listen and, and, and assimilate all the information they're getting bombarded with on TV, the media, advertising. And you see the commercials. Wake up every morning, use Listerine, use Scope. It kills 99.99% of the bacteria in your mouth. Well, that's not a good thing. You know, we and others have published that if you use bath wash, your blood pressure goes up and you lose the cardioprotective benefits of exercise and you lose the benefits of eating a, a healthy diet. So the worst thing you can do is use mouthwash. And I try to put this in perspective because most people, this is kind of like the aha moment for a lot of people. Like, oh, well, I'm doing damage by using mouthwash? Yes. The, we've known for many, many decades that you don't take an antibiotic every day for the rest of your life, right? If you've got an infection, you take a regimen of antibiotics, 7, 10, 14 days, and then you stop. You kill the bad guys, but you don't continue to take antibiotics because of the collateral damage. It's mostly non-selective killing, right? So we're killing the bad guys, but we're also killing the good guys. And there are a number of problems that occur from that. We kill the gut bacteria, you get gut dysbiosis, you get systemic disease. Well, the same thing happens in your mouth. When you kill the oral microbiome in your mouth every day, sometimes twice a day, there's consequences to that. And the number one consequence is it shuts down nitric oxide production, causes an increase in blood pressure, you lose the benefits of exercise, and you can no longer get nitric oxide from this secondary pathway. So I tell people all the time, look, if you're using mouthwash, you have to stop. I mean, the risk-benefit kind of quotient there is all risk, no benefit. So you have to stop. And then the other important thing that a lot of people don't even consider either is fluoride. You know, most toothpaste have fluoride, and fluoride is put in toothpaste because it kills bacteria. It's an antiseptic. So you have to get rid of fluoride in your toothpaste. The other major problem is most municipal water systems are fluorinated. They put fluoride in the water, in the drinking water. Why? To kill the bacteria. So now when you're drinking the water, you're killing the good bacteria, you're killing the bad bacteria, you're shutting down your thyroid function, and fluoride's a neurotoxin. So we have to rid our body of fluoride. I want to highlight the importance of this second step here. The fact that we have these bacteria on our tongue, and if we're killing them through things like fluoride or mouthwash, we're limiting this whole second pathway. And we already know that the first pathway is going to decline naturally as we age. So I can only imagine the number of people that are getting older, their first pathway is degraded down, and they're using something like mouthwash or even drinking unfiltered water and getting fluoride and killing that bacteria and then you clarify if I'm wrong, but as far as I know from preparing and reading your book and, and digging into your work, there is only these two pathways. So if you're impacting them both in a negative way, the first one just by, you know, we talked about living a healthy lifestyle helps accentuate that, but aging is going to dampen it naturally. It's so easy to mess this up is what I'm getting at. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, see, like I said, everything we do from an American lifestyle is designed to shut down nitric oxide production. Now what happens? Your blood pressure goes up. That's the number one risk factor for the number one killer of men and women worldwide, which is cardiovascular disease. Nitric oxide is important for insulin signaling. So you develop insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes. You start to develop mild cognitive disorders and vascular dementia, eventually Alzheimer's. You don't have the energy to exercise because your mitochondria aren't producing enough energy. 
So everything we know about the onset and progression of age-related chronic disease can be traced back to insufficient nitric oxide production. Then so people have to ask yourself, well, what am I doing to disrupt my nitric oxide production? Well, you're not getting enough vegetables. You're not getting enough nitrate. Two out of three Americans use mouthwash every morning. And not coincidentally, two out of three Americans have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure. And think about this. If you have high blood pressure, you go to your doctor and he puts you on a blood pressure medicine, right? And 50% of the people that are on blood pressure medicine don't respond with better blood pressure. We call this resistant hypertension. It's resistant to standard pharmacotherapy. So why is that? Well, these drugs aren't targeted towards the oral microbiome. There's ACE inhibitors that, that uh, you know, mechanistically they're affecting the angiotensin converting enzyme, shutting down uh, ANG2 production. There's calcium channel antagonists. There's uh, beta blockers, diuretics. So the reason that these patients are resistant to standard therapy is because it's the wrong target. They don't have a renin-angiotensin problem. They don't have a calcium dysregulation. They don't have a fluid imbalance. So ACE inhibitors, ARBs, calcium channel antagonists, and diuretics aren't going to affect their blood pressure. Hypertension is a symptom of oral dysbiosis. So now we're finding if you're using mouthwash and you stop and allow this microbiome to repopulate and do its job, blood pressure will normalize, and now you can get off medications. And Americans, especially older Americans, are over-medicated. They're put on one medication, two, three, four. I know people who are on 10, 12, 15 different medications. And the human body cannot and will not heal or perform when there's that many synthetic enzyme inhibitors at one time. I mean, that's not how the human body is designed to work. Okay, so for the person tuning in here, they're one of the two-thirds of Americans that have been using mouthwash to this point. They're going to stop today. But now they're worried that they've killed the good microbiome in their mouth. What do they do? How can they accentuate bringing that back? I'm assuming there's a way. And then how long does it take? You know, we published on this, I think in, we published a, a seminal paper in 2019. And we designed this experiment to answer that question. So we took normal, healthy individuals that had normal blood pressure. And for seven days, we just used mouthwash twice a day. And at the end of seven days, we measured their blood pressure. We did tongue scrapings to figure out what well, before and after, see what happened to the oral microbiome. And then we stopped the mouthwash for four days. And then after four days, let's see what happens to their blood pressure and let's see what happens to the microbiome. So the results of that study were after seven days of using mouthwash in otherwise normal tense of patients, we saw an increase in blood pressure. In fact, in one person, we saw a 21 millimeter increase in blood pressure. 21-year-old triathlete dental student. His blood pressure went up 21 millimeters of mercury in one week just by killing the bacteria in his mouth. No change in diet, no change in uh, exercise activity. The only thing we did was kill his bacteria, and we made him clinically hypertensive. And then fortunately, once we stopped, four days later, the microbiome had completely repopulated and his blood pressure had completely normalized. So this population is really resilient in the fact that if you stop killing it daily, it repopulates. We just got to give these bugs kind of what they need. So number one, get rid of fluoride, get rid of mouthwash, and then start eating more green leafy vegetables because these are what we call nitrate reducers. They're facultative anaerobic bacteria, meaning that if oxygen's around, they can respire on oxygen. If oxygen is not around, then they respire on nitrate. So the more nitrate-rich vegetables you you consume, we're feeding these bacteria a normal respiratory substrate that they can rely on and respire on, and they'll repopulate. And the beauty about that is, what we also published in that study, that the greater the diversity of the oral microbiome, the healthier the microbiome, and the better management of blood pressure. So we need diversity. There's biofilms, there's different communities on the dorsal part of the tongue, on the gingival tissue. So this, the ecology in the mouth is, is quite remarkable, but it's very resilient. So even if you've been using mouthwash for months or years, once you stop, at least the data from our study, published study shows that within four days, these bacteria will completely repopulate. Now you just got to feed them, feed them the good stuff. All right. So we know from before we touched on this quickly, the fact that the bacteria on the tongue feed on nitrates and they can feed on them as food is being chewed and, and before it's swallowed. And then also there's a secondary system, thankfully, that digests, 
and then brings the nitrates back up through the saliva. And then we get a second chance at feeding those bacteria. Now, and that's kind of the, the second, what we call a time release. So now each time you secrete, you, you salivate, you're secreting nitrate in the saliva. And this is a very inefficient system. So we can quantify this. So the, the nitrate that's, let's, let's call, we eat 150 grams of spinach salad. 90 minutes after we consume that, the nitrate that's in that spinach, only about 25% of that's going to be taken up in the gut. Right, so about a third, about a fourth of the load that you're getting from the diet is taken up in the gut and then concentrated in our salivary glands. The rest is distributed throughout the circulation, filtered through the kidneys. You excrete some, some is reabsorbed. And then only about 20%, you only get about 20% reduction efficacy of the bacteria in the mouth. So each time you salivate. So 25% absorption, uh, 20% reduction, that's 5% of the total nitrate load we're reducing into or metabolizing into nitrite and nitric oxide. So, and we, we've quantified that. We can, we can verify it stoichiometrically. I mean, this is a very beautiful system. So I think it's an inherent inefficiency because it allows the body to produce nitric oxide over a long period of time in a time release manner, provided that we have normal salivary secretion. We have normal uh, nitrate reducing bacteria on the crypts of the tongue and that our parietal cells in our stomach can produce stomach acid. Okay, so we know when it comes to the bacteria in the mouth, you've mentioned fluoride, mouthwash, those are both going to kill it. What about things like gum people are chewing, um, tongue scraping? I'm just trying to think of different inputs into the mouth and how they might benefit or cause damage there to the, to the microbiome. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of unanswered questions still. So for the most part, there's a lot of, you know, the answer is we don't know. But here's what we do know. Tongue scraping, in that same study, we found that people who did daily tongue scrapings had the greatest diversity of the oral microbiome and had the best blood pressure. But if you tongue scraped and used mouthwash, those were the patients who had the greatest increase in blood pressure upon mouthwash. So that our, our interpretation of that data was, if you do tongue scraping and don't use mouthwash, that seems to be very beneficial. And I, th I, I equate it to like tilling the soil, right? When you scrape the tongue, you're basically kind of tilling the soil and, 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 and kind of allowing these, these organisms and bacteria to repopulate and diversify. And that seems, at least in our study, to have better blood pressure management. Um, things like chewing gum, I think it depends on if it's sugar, uh, a lot of sugar in the gum, then, you know, sugar causes an overgrowth of, you know, acid producing. Uh, bacteria in the mouth and caries and cavities and, and bad things. There's other things like essential oils uh, that we don't have any answers to, things like oil pulling. I get questions all the time, and these are things that we just don't know. We haven't researched it. But unless it's antiseptic and kills non-selective bacteria, the good, the bad, then I think it's probably going to be fine. If, if, it's, if it's antiseptic, it's not going to be good. If the oral hygienic practice isn't killing any bacteria, like tongue scraping isn't killing anything, it's just kind of allowing a disturbance of the of the uh, terrain. Um, so yeah, I think you know again, there's a lot of answers that we don't have, but what we do have, it's very clear that you can't use antiseptic mouthwash, you can't add fluoride to your to your body in any capacity whatsoever, and then just eat a balanced diet in moderation with some more green leafy vegetables and. Sometimes it's really that simple. All right, we're going to move into step three. So for somebody that's lucky enough to get by step one and two, <laughs> taking right. in nitrates, they have the bacteria in their mouth, they haven't killed that. So now they have nitrite, which they're going to swallow and go into the stomach. We need an acidic environment to take the nitrite and form nitric oxide. You mentioned the antacids and how that's a problem, and, and I'd like you to get further into that to start, and then we'll talk about other things to do with the gut. So biochemically speaking, nitrite, so nitrate to nitrite is a two-electron reduction, and then nitrite to nitric oxide is just one electron. So as a biochemist, we count electrons, so we have to, we have to balance equations when we, when we do this chemistry. So the pKa of nitrite, meaning the, the, the pH in which nitrite becomes protonated to generate nitric oxide is 3.4.
And that means that at pH 3.4, 50% of the nitrite that we swallow is going to generate nitric oxide gas. The lower the pH, the greater the efficiency of protonation and conversion to nitric oxide. So when we do that, again, the nitrite becomes nitric oxide. We can detect it in the lumen of the stomach. It kills bacteria, kills H. pylori, the ulcer-causing bacteria, enhances gastric mucosal blood flow. So now you've enhanced the blood flow to the stomach so you can absorb nutrients like magnesium, iron, iodine, chromium, B vitamins. So it, it's facilitating this fundamental physiological response to, to nutrient absorption. If you can't make stomach acid because you have achlorhydria for whatever reason, or you're using an antacid, now you shut down stomach acid production. You eliminate the nitric oxide benefits of swallowing your own saliva. So now you can get overgrowth of bacteria, uh, H. pylori, you can develop gastric ulcers. You become nutrient deficient without sufficient stomach acid. You can't absorb iron. You become anemic. You can't absorb B vitamins. You can't absorb uh, zinc, chromium, selenium, a lot of these uh, trace minerals and nutrients. But more importantly, again, you shut down nitric oxide production from the disproportionation of nitrite to NO. But in 2013, 2014, there was a paper published that these antacids, specifically what's called proton pump inhibitors, things like omeprazole, pantoprazole, they actually inhibit nitric oxide being produced from the enzyme, nitric oxide synthase. So these drugs, PPI specifically, are shutting down both nitric oxide production pathways, and people who take these drugs are completely devoid of nitric oxide. Now, the consequences of that are, are apparent. Now, in 2015, it was reported that people who have been on PPIs for three to five years had a 40% higher incidence of heart attack and stroke. Not risk of heart attack and stroke, actual heart attack and strokes. And then just last week, a report came out showing that people who have been on PPIs for four years had a 35% increase in dementia and Alzheimer's. So, I mean, to me, this is like the most awakening, you know, kind of eureka moment in terms of pharmacology. These are very dangerous drugs. In fact, they were never approved by the FDA to be used chronically. The FDA approval on this years ago was for acute use for gastroesophageal reflux disease or acid reflux. Use them three to five days and then get rid of them. Never use them again unless you have another acute flare-up. But yet people are using these every day for 10, 15, 20 years. And the consequences, heart attack, stroke, Alzheimer's. Everything is on the rise. So you have to get rid of stomach acid or you have to get rid of antacids. And so that's just the nitric oxide consideration. The other problem with antacids is it prevents the breakdowns of proteins into amino acids. It's part of our normal digestion process. The human stomach is designed to make stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, to break down proteins into amino acids. Without stomach acid, you don't get breakdown of proteins. So what happens? You have undigested food particles, undigested proteins, or what we call peptides, that are emptied into the gut. They transport across the gut. You get leaky gut syndrome. Now your body sees these foreign peptides as an invader. Now you're developing antibodies against these peptides, and that's the basis for foodborne allergies. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't have peanut allergies, milk allergies, all these allergies that kids in school today have. And I think it can be traced back to the use of antacids as a kid because you can't break down milk proteins into amino acids. You can't break down any protein to amino acids. You develop a foodborne allergy, and it's the basis for autoimmunity. These are very dangerous drugs and should never be prescribed. It should be taken off the market over the counter. The evidence is very clear. Now that this data is becoming public, what you just talked about there, a couple different studies, do you find in the medical world doctors are hearing this and changing the way they prescribe? You know, it's very difficult to treat, to teach an old dog new tricks, <laughs> especially physicians, right? Because a lot of them think they already know everything. So how can you teach me something new? Uh, but some are receptive. You know, some are very keen on keeping up with the published literature and understanding the advancement of science and the translation into clinical medicine. But here's what's, I mean, to me, it's so obvious looking from the outside looking in, because if you look back kind of from a 50,000 foot view and just look at the observations. These class of drugs are causing heart attacks, strokes, and Alzheimer's. 
Okay, so that's a, that's an interesting observation, and it's association, right? But it's not causation. But now we work backwards and figure out mechanistically exactly what's causing the increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. It's because it's shutting down nitric oxide production. So now we have a biologically plausible mechanism for the interesting observations on a global population perspective. And so now we know mechanistically that there is causation. You shut down stomach acid production. You shut down nitric oxide production. This causes increase in heart attack and stroke causes decrease in blood flow to the brain. You get mild cognitive disorders, vascular dementia, Alzheimer's. You develop metabolic disease. So now what do you do? Number one, you have to stop. But number two, you have to restore the production of nitric oxide. And that's kind of how we're trying to integrate this because some people it's very difficult to get off antacids because they've been so dependent upon them for many years. So then how do we address those patients and basically mitigate the risk of them having a heart attack or stroke or developing Alzheimer's? When you look at all the people taking these drugs. What is at the root of that? For somebody that wants to get off of them and get to the root of that issue, how do they begin? Well, the problem with physicians today is they don't have time to to seek the root cause of why the patient's presenting with certain clinical presentation, right? And so it's just easy. If if you've got a patient that comes to your office and says, hey, doc, I've got acid reflux. Well, you know, for 40 years, you've written a prescription for antacid. So it's easy. They're in and out of the office in five minutes. You get reimbursed for your time. And it's a, it's an economic model, but it's certainly not a, a viable physiological model. So what I tell people is you have to understand how the human body works. So the human body is designed to make stomach acid. And so what then you got to ask yourself, chemically, how do the parietal cells convert the, how does it create hydrochloric acid in the lumen of the stomach? Well, that that reaction is very well elucidated. You need zinc, you need sodium bicarb, um, you need B vitamins, and you need iodine. But yet, if you can't make stomach acid because you've been on acids for a number of years, you're deficient in B vitamins, you're deficient in zinc, and you're deficient in iodine. So now when you get off these antacids, your body doesn't have what it needs for the parietal cells to make hydrochloric acid. So you're going to remain acid deficient. So I tell people you got to supplement with iodine, 12 and a half milligrams a day, 15 milligrams of zinc, salt, B vitamins, and now you've given your body what it needs. It has the raw material to make hydrochloric acid in the parietal cells. Now you can make stomach acid. You can digest proteins into amino acids. You can generate nitric oxide, and your acid reflux goes away. Acid reflux is a is a symptom of insufficient stomach acid production. So giving a substance that inhibits further inhibits stomach acid production is counterintuitive. And I think the consequences of that over the past 40 years have been revealed. It's not the way to eliminate acid reflux, and it's causing more harm and providing zero benefit. So this takes time, right? So what I tell people acutely, and number one, I think it's a very important point. You can't just stop these drugs cold turkey because right? you're going to get a rebound of, of, of acid production. So what, what I tell people is you have to wean off. So whatever you're taking, if you've been taking on a daily basis, cut the dose in half, take half a dose for three or four days, then take that half a dose every other day for three or four days, and then you can stop those drugs. But you have to slowly wean off, titrate the dose down. And then during that process, before every meal, just take a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar, vinegar is acetic acid. So it's going to acidify the lumen of the stomach so if your body can't make stomach acid, we're going to deliver acid directly into the lumen of the stomach. Now you acidify that medium, you absorb nutrients, you break down proteins into amino acids, and you don't get acid reflux. It's very simple. How do you feel about supplements like HCL and taking digestive enzymes? Now, look, I think they're very important, and there's a place for those because um, you know we need these enzymes, and we need to give the body what it needs to break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, right? And then the bacteria in our gut, you know, use small chain uh, amino acids and and butyrate and and fatty acids. Um, So we got to feed the microbiome, but we give our body what it needs in terms of amino acids from proteins, uh, carbohydrates, and then break down fat. So if if our body's deficient in these digestive enzymes, in fact, I take digestive enzymes typically after every meal, especially when I travel because it's Not always, we don't always eat healthy when we're traveling. So we got to give our body all the help it can get. And then, yeah, HCL, betaine hydrochloride. I'm a big fan of those because we need to acidify the lumen of the stomach. 
It's the basis of all digestion and nutrient assimilation and nutrient absorption. Okay, so taking our story here even further, we have the nitrite getting to the stomach. Assuming there's proper acid there, it's going to turn into the nitric oxide. What happens to it there? Because I know the molecule of nitric oxide, it doesn't last very long. So yeah, what happens? I'm picturing it either in the endothelium, coming back to our first example, how it can be made, or it's now in the stomach. How do we have a systemic effect? That's a very good question. I think, let's go back to the start of this because when the very first question is what is nitric oxide? And maybe I, meant, I, I didn't state this, but it's a gas. And once it's produced, it's gone in less than a second. So now you can imagine what's, how does this gas, this fleeting gas that once produced is gone in less than a second? How does it control and regulate so many fundamental physiological processes? And it does this to several ways. Number one, it's a gas that freely, di freely diffuses across cell membranes, right? So it can diffuse several millimeters into tissue. So it can immediately be absorbed into the bloodstream. It binds to the red blood cell, hemoglobin in our red blood cells. And so it's transported bound to hemoglobin in, in our red blood cells. It's oxidized back to nitrite. The nitrite is vasoactive in the circulation, but it also binds to glutathione. And glutathione is our master antioxidant hormone. And so that's a tripeptide, three amino acids, one of them being cysteine, which is a sulfur-containing amino acid. So NO binds to the sulfur of glutathione, and then it transports and it extends the biological half-life from one millisecond out to tens of minutes and hours. So now we have a hierarchy of these nitric oxide, vasoactive nitric oxide metabolites that are distributed throughout the whole body. But again, this is dependent upon sufficient nitric oxide production, sufficient available thiols, kind of redox active thiols, and the ability of hemoglobin in the red blood cell to latch onto that nitric oxide and then transport it. And that's what oxygenates individual cells and tissues of the body, NO bound to hemoglobin. Okay, to make sure I understand this correctly then. Very quickly, this gas is going to disappear, but if it has secondary effects, then it can stick around in the body for longer. Yeah, these are called second messengers, right? So nitric oxide is kind of the primary signaling molecule, and then it activates and forms these other kind of chemical adducts, right? So the first pathway with you, you know, binds to an enzyme called guanylocyclase, produces cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP is a second messenger that's dependent upon nitric oxide production. S nitrosoglutathione is a second messenger that's dependent upon nitric oxide production. NO bound to hemoglobin in the red blood cell is a second messenger and transport mechanism for bioactive nitric oxide gas. So it preserves the vasoactivity and prevents it from being gone in less than a second. Got it. And how does glutathione fit in again? Nitric oxide can bind to the, the sulfur, the cysteine residue of glutathione. And then this tripeptide actually delivers nitric oxide uh, systemically. And so at certain kind of what we call redox potential, at certain, so redox potential is an electrical potential at which an electron can be abstracted from a biomolecule. And it's that redox reduction oxidation potential that allows for nitric oxide to come off at the right time in the right place from glutathione. And then it can dilate the blood vessels, it can activate soluble guanamide cyclase and all these other second messengers. And I believe you said for hours, once some of these reactions have occurred, it can stick around in the body. What is the timeline again? How far into the future can the NO have an effect? Well, there's, there's different, what we call biological half-lives of different nitric oxide metabolites. One, when nitride reacts, with, when nitric oxide reacts with oxygen, it forms nitrite. So just like the nitrite formed in our saliva, <coughs> when NO is formed and oxygen's around, it reforms nitrite. Then if you just infuse nitrite intravenously, you get a half-life of this molecule of about 110 minutes, two hours. And a half-life means that after two hours, 50% of that nitrite is gone. And then after another two hours, another 50% is gone or 75% is gone. So usually five or six half-lives tell us that, that what you initially gave is like 99% gone. So five to six half-lives would be 10 to 12 hours for nitrite. For s it's it's probably a little bit longer, maybe two to three hour half-life. And then NO bound to hemoglobin, it's the absolute essential kind of mechanism for tissue oxygenation. Uh, and it's what controls nitric oxide delivery from the 
arterioles all the way to the venous side. So when when uh, the red blood cell goes from the arteries to the vein through the capillaries, it's what we call this P50, where oxygen comes off, you pick up carbon dioxide, but this process doesn't occur without nitric oxide. So for that, NO bound to hemoglobin, the respiratory cycle, you know, probably, you know, one minute or so each time the blood circulates, uh, you know, basically getting six liters per minute pumped through the heart, which is full full blood uh, body volume. So NO bound to hemoglobin is probably about a minute half-life. And where this becomes really practical when it comes to half-life and how long this lasts in the system is when it comes to dosing. We know from before that, you know, different produce is going to have different amounts of nitrate to start. But you did give us a baseline number there. I think it was per day that we're aiming for. I'll have you restate what that is. And then where I get curious here when it comes to, again, these half-life numbers, is it better to have, say, like a bolus of nitrates at three times, you know, during the day at three different meals? Or is it better to have them spread out more through the day? Basically, how often is the ideal of taking in nitrates to have the best effect? Well, the data, the clinical data, if we look at uh, regulation of blood, blood pressure and the impact on exercise performance or athletic performance, we know that we need at least 300 to 500 milligrams as a bolus, as a single serving, right? So taken in at once. You're not going to get the effect if you're taking... 100 milligrams in a meal for breakfast, 100 milligrams for lunch, 100 milligrams. You need it as a bolus all at once. But the beauty of this pathway is once you consume that, it takes 90 minutes for this to become activated. Now for the next 6, 8, 10 hours, we're slowly titrating that system and slowly generating nitric oxide over time. So the best bang for your buck is going to be all you need is just one kind of bolus, whether it's ideally at lunch or, or dinner or whenever throughout the day, you know, depending upon what you're going to be doing. If you're about to run a race or do a, you know, a, a marathon or triathlete, then you probably want to do that before, at least 90 minutes before. Um, so, yeah, I think, and, there, and what we're finding is there's really no added benefit to doing more, right? The body kind of self-regulates. You give it what it needs. It's going to take the nitric oxide, generate it upon demand, but giving more nitrate is not going to always generate more nitric oxide to see better performance, better regulation of blood flow or blood pressure. Important we got into that because you took it the other way. I was talking more about like having little doses throughout the day to keep topped up. But you're saying you got to make sure you're hitting that bolus with enough in one serving to actually have the impact. So if you were to do what I was talking about, you wouldn't have the same impact on the body. You got to have enough in one serving to have the impact. Because it goes back to this 5% reduction efficacy, right? 25% uptake in the gut, 20% reduction by the oral bacteria. So let's just say if, you, if, if you're taking in 100 milligrams of nitrate, you're going to generate 5 milligrams of nitrite, and that's not going to be enough to really see any vasoactive activity, dilate blood vessels, normalize blood pressure, induce mitochondrial biogenesis, improve performance. So we need to titrate it up enough to at least 300 milligrams where we're getting enough of that to activate these endogenous pathways. Okay. While we're talking about the 300 milligrams, it gets me thinking about somebody that gets really ambitious and they try and aim for like 500 milligrams in a bolus. And we know a lot of, we've talked about a lot of the benefits of NO throughout the conversation, one being that the vessels get dilated. So what I'm getting at here, can we have too much? Can we over dilate vessels? Can we overwhelm the body by having too much at once? Nitrate, probably not. I mean, because when we looked at the night, at the Japanese diet, you know, sometimes they're getting 1,500, 2,000 milligrams through certain dietary choices and certain foods they eat. And I think that's why this is an efficient, such an inefficient mechanism, right? Because if we converted all of that into uh, nitrite and nitric oxide, then probably after a, you know, heavy meal of a vegetarian or plant based meal, Everybody would get an unsafe drop in blood pressure, they'd pass out and, and go to sleep because they don't have enough perfusion pressure, right? They get syncope. So the body is very resilient in the fact that it regulates what it needs. But it's like a U-shaped curve, right? Just like everything in, in physiology. We know too little is bad, too much is bad. So we have to find that sweet spot in terms of nitric oxide. So how do you know if there's too much nitric oxide? Well, there's only two signs of toxicity. 
Number one, you get an unsafe drop in blood pressure. And number two, you get what's called methemoglobinemia, where you start to oxidize the iron of hemoglobin in the red blood cell, and you oxidize it to form methemoglobin. And then you reduce the oxygen-carrying capacity of the red blood cell. So you become cyanotic. You'll get blue around the lips. Uh, and it's, it's a very serious condition. But typically, you'll develop really low blood pressure before you will ever develop any methemoglobinemia. And when it comes to the other way around, when people find out that they're deficient in NO, how do they typically find their way to your information? Is it because their blood pressure is running awry and they can't control it? I know erectile dysfunction, I've heard you talk about that being a canary in the coal mine. How do people know symptom-wise if they're deficient in NO? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a very good question and something we've been trying to answer now for, for 25 years. And so the first question people always ask was, how do I know if I need nitric oxide? How do I know if I'm deficient? And so about 15 years ago, I developed a, a salivary test strip that we could test your saliva. And what, really what we were testing were your, the, the ability of your bacteria in your body to reduce nitrate to nitrite. So when we sample saliva, we're looking at, number one, are you ingesting enough nitrate? Do you have the right bacteria to convert the nitrate to nitrite? Because on the saliva test strip, we're measuring salivary nitrite. And I think that's, I tell people, that's a good tool to have in your toolbox. There's no false negatives. If you're low, you're low. But there are some false positives. And that's why I've gotten away from the test strip because there's people with active dental infections, oral infections show that they're kind of optimal on the nitric oxide test strip, but systemically they're completely depleted, right? The best example is a 50-year-old hypertensive, overweight, diabetic patient with ED. He spits on the test strip and it's bright pink. Well, obviously, this guy isn't replete in nitric oxide. It's a false positive on his test. So what what we rely on, and it's the question you brought up, we have to rely on symptoms. So if you're nitric oxide deficient, what happens? The first thing that typically happens is you develop erectile dysfunction, right? Because when you lose the regulation of blood flow, when you can no longer dilate the blood vessels of the sex organs, whether it's the penis or the clitoris, and that's dependent upon nitric oxide. So if those if that vascular bed can't generate nitric oxide to dilate those organs to get engorgement, then you're nitric oxide deficient. You develop erectile dysfunction. That you, that's, as you said, the canary in the coal mine. That tells you that something's wrong. That's usually first. Second, your blood pressure starts to creep up, right? When you lose the production of a main vasodilatory molecule, nitric oxide, blood vessels start to constrict. They get rigid. They get stiff. And now with each beat of the heart, they causes damage. This pulse wave travels really quickly through the vascular tree, causes a lot of damage, endothelial dysfunction, upregulation of adhesion molecules, platelet aggregation, monocyte, neutrophils, start sticking to the lining of the blood vessel and you start to get plaque. Then thirdly, typically you develop exercise intolerance. So if you walk up a flight of steps, you become short of breath and you just can't catch your breath or you can't even go out and walk 20 minutes without feeling tired. That's a nitric oxide deficiency problem. If you're insulin resistant, type 2 diabetic, that's a nitric oxide deficiency problem because nitric oxide is required for insulin signaling and glucose uptake. And then typically fifth, you start develop, you lose your memory. You develop mild cognitive disorders, if not corrected, vascular dementia, if not corrected, Alzheimer's. Because all of those are a loss of regulation of blood flow to the brain, when you don't get blood flow to the brain, you can't get the good stuff in, you can't take the trash out, beta amyloid plaque builds up, tau tangles, the hallmarks of Alzheimer's. So you mentioned the test strips there being an objective way of testing this. I know there's also a test I've heard you talk about called the endopat. Talk more about what that is, and then if you feel that's something that is only warranted if we're suffering from other symptoms like you mentioned, or who should get one of those done? I think everyone should. You know, this is a functional test. It's a it's a non-invasive functional medical device. But it, it's really the only device that tells us how well our blood vessels are making nitric oxide, right? And so the basis of this, we call this flow-mediated dilatation or, or reactive hyperemia. So the basis of this test is you put a blood pressure cuff over your brachial artery up on the, your, near your bicep. And then you inflate this cuff to super systolic level. So with, now there's no blood flow into the forearm. So you're completely shutting off the blood supply to the forearm. And you do this for five minutes. And it's a little bit 
I wouldn't say uncomfortable, but you start, you know, it's like kind of like sleeping on your arm, right? And your arm falls asleep. You're going to get tingly. Uh, but what happens is when you release the cuff, now these blood vessels and tissues have been deprived of oxygen for five minutes and they want to increase blood flow. And they do this through the production of nitric oxide. So you can look at the degree of vasodilation, what's called reactive hyperemia, and that tells you, and through a pretty complex algorithm, it can tell you your endothelial function or how well the endothelial cells of your blood vessels produce nitric oxide. If you get a lot of vasodilation, that tells us that your blood vessels are making sufficient nitric oxide. If you don't get any dilation in response to relieving the, the releasing the blood pressure cuff, then that tells us that your blood vessels aren't making any nitric oxide. And even though you may not have ED or high blood pressure or any of the symptoms we talked about, that's really the first sign and symptom that you're on a very slippery slope to developing chronic disease, ED, hypertension, uh, everything we talked about. So now you need to take corrective steps and figure out why aren't my blood vessels able to make nitric oxide? Is it because of my diet? Is it because of what I'm doing? Is it because of some drug therapy I'm taking? Is it? And then you start got to start asking questions and then start doing the things that we've shown clinically to enhance endothelial nitric oxide production. All right, just so I'm clear, the test strip, I see how that's going to be testing the second pathway, although not perfect. You talked about how there can be issues there. Doing the the endopat, it sounds like it in the beginning when you're talking about it, it's testing the endothelium, but then you mentioned taking in nitrates, I believe. So what I'm getting at is what can we decipher from each test? Is it an overlap of the two different pathways or is it one is testing one and one is testing the other? The test strip is kind of measuring what we call total body nitric oxide availability. So whether you're getting nitric oxide produced in the lining of your blood vessels from the endothelium, that nitric oxide is primarily oxidized to nitride and nitrate, right? And so the, the human body doesn't discriminate nitrate coming from the diet or nitrate being produced from the oxidation of nitric oxide. It just sees nitrate circulating in the blood. And then through the silin receptor, it's taken up in our salivary glands and then secreted in our saliva. Then we reduce it to nitric oxide. So if you're low on the test strip, let's just let's use an example. If you test your saliva and it doesn't turn pink and it's completely white, that tells us that you're low in nitric oxide. But it doesn't tell us why you're low. Is it because you have endothelial dysfunction and your endothelial cells can't make nitric oxide? Is it because you're not getting enough nitrate from your diet? Is it because you're getting enough nitrate from your diet, but you're using mouthwash and you don't have the right oral bacteria? So, but now you can start to interrogate each of these and then figure out exactly what's going wrong and why the test strip isn't lighting up. But the very important distinction is the test strip is a biochemical test. It's measuring a single molecule in one biological compartment. The endopad is measuring the functional production of nitric oxide in the lining of the blood vessel. So a functional measurement will always be more reliant and, and meaningful than a biochemical test because there's too many factors that are affecting the biochemistry in the saliva and the, nit in the, the nitride in the saliva. And when it comes to both of those tests, how far back are they looking? Are they just kind of looking at the last 24 hours and how much nitrate we've taken in plus our endothelial function? How do we get a picture over a longer period of time? Is it just doing the tests again and again? Yeah, you know, any, any test we do, whether it's a blood draw, whether it's a functional test, it's basically one point in time, right? It's what's in your blood at the time they did the blood draw. Same thing with the test. It's how your blood vessels are reacting at the time we do the test. Is it... When you're fasted, did you just eat a really unhealthy diet? Because And we've done these studies. So if you do it fasted, you, get, you show good endothelial function, you go and eat McDonald's fries, you know, anti or an inflammatory diet, then you redo that test, you're going to have a blunted response to your endothelial function. And then some of our clinical trials we've done with our product technology, you can get a baseline endothelial function, take the lozenge or take our nitric oxide, Four, five, six, twelve 12 hours later, we retest, and now we can improve it. So all these tests are basically capturing a single moment in time based on what you did before that. So I think to get a true sense of how your body's reacting or performing is you do this over time and track it. 
And if it gets better, then I tell people, don't get away from what's working. Keep doing it. If it gets worse, then you got to stop and think, what am I doing that's making my endothelial function worse? Right. As you explain that, it gets me thinking about the person that goes on a week vacation and forgets their mouthwash at home. And then all of a sudden they try and do a test to see where they're at. And, you know, you mentioned, I think it was only four days that the bacteria can start to repopulate and, and, and start converting. So I could see how things could change quite rapidly. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've been studying the human body for more than 25 years and I'm still just in awe of how resilient it is. You know, even though we insult the body, some people insult their body every day, all day for years, decades, and yet they're still living, right? The body's so resilient. I mean, they may not, may not be healthy, but the body's still performing in some capacity or they'd be dead. So, and I think it's just remarkable that the body's able to put up with all this abuse that we give it. Um, but yet it doesn't have to be that way. We understand the biochemistry specifically as it relates to nitric oxide, that we know what interrupts it. We know how to improve it. And so for me, there's really no excuse and there's no excuse for cardiovascular disease being the number one killer of men and women worldwide, even today, billions of dollars in research. You know, we know what causes cardiovascular disease. We know how to diagnose it and we know how to fix it. What's the problem? It's education and awareness. Right. We have to go out and change the way people are treating cardiovascular disease. We have to bring nitric oxide to the fore and make it the number one consideration for physicians seeing patients with poorly managed chronic disease, uncontrolled high blood pressure, uncontrolled diabetes. Why is that? Well, think about nitric oxide. Nitric oxide controls insulin signaling, glucose uptake, regulation of blood flow to every organ, tissue, and cell in the body. And it decreases inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. Every single chronic disease, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, same three things. Decreased blood flow, inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. Nitric oxide corrects every single one of those. All right, let's get practical. For somebody that's tuned into this point, they're headed to the grocery store. They're going to start loading their cart with, with a lot of the leafy greens and beets, try and get their nitrate level up. But then they get to the meat area and they go and grab their bacon and they see nitrate nitrite free and then they're really confused they're supposed to be getting these through their produce but yet their bacon and their meats are advertising that they're free of these so let's talk about what's going on there well first i tell people turn off your tv and stop watching advertising because <laughs> we're, we're being misinformed i know in today's time that's probably not a surprise but you know i think one of the greatest myths that's ever been perpetuated there's two in the medical sciences. The first one is cholesterol causes heart disease. The greatest myth that's ever been perpetuated in the medical sciences. Cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease. The other one, which is near and dear to my heart, is that nitrite and cured and processed meats causes cancer. I mean, it's a completely myth that's been perpetuated now for 50 or 60 years. So why is that? Well, years ago, they found in the 1950s, it was first reported that nitrite cured fish, when consumed, was causing an increased risk of certain cancers, liver cancers, gastro, or certain stomach cancer. So this is what we call an association, right? This is nutritional epidemiology, where you take populations who are eating certain amounts of these foods, looking at outcomes years later. An association, but not causation. Now, to establish causation, you've got to have a biologically plausible mechanism to tie that observation to the increased risk of cancer. So in the 60s and 70s, they, they came up with this thought that nitrite can form nitrosamines, nitrosamines can intercalate DNA, cause mutations, and cause cancer. So now the story was complete. Nitrite cures meat, causes nitrosamine formation, nitrosamines cause cancer. Well, now their story falls apart because in 2000, the, uh, the National Toxicology Program of the U.S. government did a dose escalation study to try to answer that question. Does nitrite cause cancer? What they found was through dose escalation studies in mice, rats, and rabbits, found there was no evidence of cancer-causing activity by nitrite in any animal and any cancers. In fact, at some doses, it was anti-cancer. So now you start to think, well, we know that vegetables, a plant-based diet, vegetarian diet, lower incidence of cancers, right? If nitrate and nitrite cause cancer, vegetarians, the Japanese, Mediterraneans would have about a hundred times higher cancer rate than meat eaters. 
but we know it's just the opposite. So nitride and nitrate does not cause cancer. And I've I've consulted for companies like Kraft, Oscar Mayer, these meat companies, and I tell them, look, you, you have to get away from advertising no nitrite, no nitrate added cured meat because nitrite is absolutely essential for food safety. If your sausage and bacon and hot dogs didn't have nitrite, there would be an epidemic of foodborne uh, illnesses and deaths from E. coli, botulism, salmonella. Nitrite is the only thing that preserves the antimicrobial activity of ready-to-eat foods. Uh, and so now, in the 1970s, the Code of Federal Regulation changes. says if you're adding nitrite to any cured and processed meat product, you have to add a certain amount of ascorbic acid, erythrobate, and today they use erythrobate, right? So that prevents any nitrosative chemistry. And we actually measured this. We published this in 2009, and we took regular nitrite cured bacon, and then we took no nitrite added bacon. And we brought it to the lab, we quantified the nitrite in it, and we found that the no nitrite added bacon had five times higher nitrite in it than the conventionally nitrite cured bacon. So it's really consumer deception because what these meat companies are doing is they're adding vegetable powder, which is a source of nitrate, Then they add a starter culture of bacteria called staph carnosis. And these bacteria convert the nitrate to nitrite on the surface of the meat. And then the nitrite cures the meat. So they're not adding sodium nitrite directly to the meat. They're adding celery salt or or different powders and then putting bacteria on it to, to form nitrite to cure the meat. And what does that mean? Well, it's a variable yield. So the the food quality, the shelf life of these organically cured products are less. Um, The quality of these products are much less. And there's very little residual nitrite even in conventionally grown or eventually cured uh, nitrite added meats. So I tell people, don't spend an extra 2 to $3 a pound to buy no nitrite, no nitrate added meats. Go and buy it. You shouldn't be afraid of it. In fact, I tell the meat companies, you should say supplemented or fortified with nitrate or nitrite. Because you need that. We know it's an essential, indispensable nutrient needed for human physiology. All right. So there's a lot there. The fact that when you're buying nitrate-free, you've in your lab tested and the actual nitrate-free had higher levels (laughs) because of this this celery powder or celery juice and the conversion with the bacteria. Okay. But underneath all of this is the fact that you're saying it doesn't matter it actually be potentially in our advantage to fortify with these. Well, you got to ask yourself, you know, that's exactly right. So the use of nitrate salts dates back thousands of years, <coughs> excuse me, long before refrigeration. And these early settlers had to preserve meat. So if they went and killed a buffalo or a deer or some animal, there was no refrigeration. So how do they preserve that carcass that's going to get them through the winter? How do they do that? Well, thousands of years ago, it was discovered that if they use sea salt and to preserve that, then it created this cured meat color. And so what it was, it was what's called saltpeter, potassium nitrate, that was naturally found in sea salt, that when the bacteria on that would convert the nitrate to nitrite. So this goes, this chemistry goes back thousands of years. And so in, I guess, the early 19th century and and, and later uh, the turn of the century, it was realized that the mechanism for this was nitrite being reduced in a low oxygen environment to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide binds to the iron of uh, myoglobin in the muscle, and that forms the nice pink nitrosyl hemochrome pigment. And that's the pink color you see in all uh, cured meat. But it's not just the antimicrobial activity. Nitrite also inhibits lipid oxidation. You know, lipid oxidation in humans causes a lot of oxidative stress and disrupts membranes and causes oxidation of of fats in membranes. Nitrite prevents lipid oxidation. So that's an essential anti-inflammatory molecule in human physiology. So the chemistry of meat curing by nitrite basically is the exact same in what we would hope to get in kind of curing the own human body of chronic disease. So nitrite is absolutely a cure. It's a cure for uh, to, for meats to prevent foodborne pathogens, prevent lipid oxidation and the rancidity and warmed over flavors, but it's also a cure in human physiology for curing conditions of nitric oxide deficiency. 
which is heart attack, stroke, vascular dementia, and, and diabetes. So that's what we focused on for the past 20 years is how do we provide a treatment, a therapeutic, a safe and effective nitric oxide technology that can overcome a lot of these poorly managed diseases. So when it comes to the nitrite in conventional meats, are they getting that from sea salt and from plants? Or what are they doing to, to get that and add it to the product? Well, in conventionally cured meat products, like your normal hot dogs, bacon, sausage, ready-to-eat uh, meat, they're adding sodium nitrite. So it's just a salt. It's a white salt. They add it. There's restrictions and there's regulations on what type of product, how much you have to add to get an efficient cure and antimicrobial activity. For the organ organically cured or no nitrite added cure, they're adding, it's primarily the industry standard is celery salt. So celery is a high source of nitrate. You sprinkle that as a brine. Then you add the starter culture, the bacteria. The bacteria reduce the nitrate to nitrite. <clears throat> and that's where you're getting the cure. But in even in, you know, uncured meat, like if you take a steak, for example, that's uncured, unprocessed, just call it a ribeye, and we grind that up, there's still nitrite and nitrate in that muscle. And why is that? Well, that cow was once eating grass, green grass, right? That green grass has nitrate in it, and cows are ruminants with several stomachs. So now they've got a diverse microbiome that's reducing that nitrate into nitrite and nitric oxide, and it's actually assimilated into the muscle. So now when we eat the fresh meat from that cow, whether it's hamburger meat or a steak, we're getting a source of nitrite and nitrate. Because of what that cow ate, grass. Cows are vegetarians. I just happen to eat vegetarians. The cow, I'm a meat eater, right? <laughs> Which brings me to my next question. Because there's so much popularity these days in the carnivore diet and only eating meat, how much of a significant source would beef be of nitrates and nitrites? It's it's not a significant source. So I I, I think... You know, I'm not a big fan of either of these extreme diets like a hardcore carnivore or hardcore plant-based. I think we get our nutrients from a, a balance of food in moderation, from a diverse food population. I think that's how we evolved, and I think that's what's going to give us the most uh, nutrients we get. So when we quantify this, and we've actually done this because we wanted to see if if doing a straight carnivore diet for a period of months or years is this going to cause problems in terms of vascular compliance and nitric oxide production? And the data tell us that you're really not getting enough nitrate from eating a, a strict carnivore diet because there's so little in the muscle itself uh, that we need the vegetables, we need the plants to fuel this pathway. And so I think that's why it's important that we eat a balanced diet in moderation, throw in some green leafy vegetables, um, you know, get we need B vitamins and iron and a lot of the micronutrients found in in animal proteins and animal meats that we're not getting from plants, and we need the nutrients in plants that we're not getting from from animal proteins and meats. So I think I think we need a balance. And if you're not if you're not doing that, then I think it's you know you should do a micronutrient analysis to figure out what is your, what's your body missing, and then supplement that nutrient. And that's personalized nutrition. Which this naturally takes us to plant toxins. So people on a carnivore diet typically talk about plant toxins, wanting to avoid things like phytic acid and lectins and oxalates. And we can take the oxalate piece there and expand upon that. Say somebody's using spinach to get their dark leafy greens, to get their nitrates, they're going to be getting a big hit of oxalates at the same time. So what would you say to that person? Well, you know, some people are sensitive to it and some people aren't. Obviously, if you're sensitive to oxalates, you're prone for kidney stones, gallstones, things like that. So everybody's different. Um, and so we have to, that's why I think it's impossible to kind of ascribe a one size fits all for everybody. You know, I think there's some truth in, you know, blood types and, and requiring certain nutrients and certain dietary patterns from based on your blood type. I think it's dependent upon the gut microbiome. Some people are sensitive and can't digest things because they have gut dysbiosis. So we have to fix the gut and then now they become less sensitive to, to different foods or food allergies. But the, again, the body is really resilient in the fact that if you 
give the body what it needs, the body's going to perform for you. But if you're sensitive to certain things, then obviously that's a sense and a sign that your body, your body telling you, hey, this really doesn't agree with me. So let's let's avoid that. As you talk about the blood type there, it gets me thinking about genetics as a whole. And this, to me, would apply more to the first pathway, the endothelium. How much variance do you see between different people and how good they are at making NO? We know the whole field. When I took genetics as a um, sophomore at University of Texas when I was an undergrad, that genetics course is completely antiquated to what how we know genetics today. So the genetics I learned is completely different than the genetics today. And you can no longer blame your disease or your condition on genetics. Because now this whole field of epigenetics, of how we regulate and turn genes on and turn genes off, is what controls the day. Uh, and we know certain foods can be epigenetic drivers and turn certain pathways on, expression of downregulate certain proteins, upregulate other proteins. And it's the nutrients from the diet that control the epigenetic regulation of protein expression. So let's take, for example, and there's all types of different genetic SNPs or what's called single nucleotide polymorphisms. And so those are just uh, errors in the genetic code or the sequencing to transcribe and translate that protein. So the most obvious, or if you've got a SNP in your ENOS or any of the NOS enzymes, then probably that enzyme, even if it's expressed and, and made into a functional protein, it's not going to have optimal activity, right? Because there's a, there's a, problem in the, there's an error in the sequence of that, the, the DNA sequence, the amino acid sequence. <clears throat> the other problem is the MTHFR, what we call the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. And that SNP is, you know, depending on which reports you read, 45 to 55% of the U.S. population. So if you have an MTHFR SNP, then you're by definition nitric oxide deficient because that enzyme is what converts biopterin to tetrahydrobiopterin. That's the rate limiting step in nitric oxide production through the enzyme. So MTHFR, you have an uncoupled NOS, you can't make nitric oxide. So now you're dependent upon the nitrate pathway because you have severe endothelial dysfunction. All right. So where that comes into play is genetic wise, like you just talked about, and then also aging. The good thing about this is we know there are two pathways and not that you should be neglectful of pathway two till you get older. But when you do get older, if you do have a genetic you know, predisposition, luckily we can make up for it, or at least largely so with the second pathway. Yeah, you know, the, 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 there's enormous redundancy in the human body. And it, it didn't make any sense to me that if nitric oxide is so important and critical in everything we read in the science and observe in clinical medicine, then why would the body develop a single pathway to make nitric oxide? And then this pathway becomes dysfunctional over time. And so, I think the way the human body is designed is one can compensate for the other. There's a balance of these. But if you develop endothelial dysfunction, then you become reliant upon the dietary pathway. If you have good endothelial function, then you can get away with eating a poor diet. And I think I look at kids, you know, I have young kids, 15 and, and 12 now, and they, you know, even when I was young, I didn't eat a very health, healthy diet, but yet I was in great shape. I was physically active. I wasn't overweight and I was an athlete. So why is that? Well, it's because my endothelial function was good and I could get away from not getting nitric oxide from my vegetables. But now the older I get, I realize that now I've got to compensate some. I need to throw in some more green leafy vegetables and fill this pathway because, you know, if I do some bad things and I go out and, you know, eat an inflammatory meal or if I'm traveling a lot and it's exposed to a lot of toxins, then my endothelial function goes down and I've got to compensate over here. But I think if we can maintain good endothelial function, maintain nitric oxide production from our diet, then we're truly optimized humans. And I think that's what defines, you know, human optimization and whether that's, you know, improvement in longevity, longer lifespan, better quality of life, better performance in the boardroom, the bedroom or on the athletic field. I mean, for me, it's about human optimization. Earlier, we talked about arginine and the fact that there's definitely no advantage to supplementing and putting more of that substrate into the mix. There could even be detriment. I want to zoom back from that and talk about supplements as a whole. And I know you have a lineup of products as well. Let's talk about your products versus some of the more classical supplements people are tuned into, like possibly going to the health food store and 
not arginine, we've already got into that, but other ones and what's useful and what's not. Yeah, you know, it's one of my biggest frustrations. You know, I'm trained as a biochemist and physiologist, so my whole motivation in getting this field was to develop, understand human disease to the extent that we could fix it, right? So we, we've, we've accomplished that. We know nitric oxide enzymology, biochemistry inside out. Now we know how to fix it. So the, my underlying objective and motivation was to develop safe and effective drugs for nitric oxide. Get this technology through the FDA so we can have safe and effective drugs for, for physicians to write prescriptions for their patients. But we know that that takes about 10 years and $800 million to bring that to market. So years ago, I developed a dietary supplement product technology so that we could take what's missing from the diet, primarily in the form of nitrate or the ability to convert it to nitride and nitric oxide, and then give that back to nitric oxide deficient patients, right? But the, the frustration and the problem in the nutrition and dietary supplement industry is that everybody says the same thing. Right? You got the arginine folks pushing their nitric oxide products in. It's a nitric oxide product. It's going to promote nitric oxide, help in blood pressure, performance, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a, there was an act called the Deshea Act, the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act uh, from years ago, maybe 20 years ago, that allowed companies to now market and support the normal structure and function of, of the human body. That was how dietary supplements were born. But you can't make drug claims. You can just say they support the normal structure and function of the body. But yet 99% of the products out there that are marketed as nitric oxide products do not work. We've tested them. They don't stimulate. They don't activate. They don't produce nitric oxide. So these are called nutraceuticals. So my challenge was, how do we differentiate what I do, what my products do, which actually generate nitric oxide gas that we can quantify, we can verify, and we can detect, how do I differentiate that from all these other yahoos on the market that are selling nitric oxide products that don't do anything, but deceiving and defrauding the consumer? So I created a new term called nitraceuticals. So it's on the kind of a play on nutraceuticals, but what we do are nitraceuticals. And we actually generate nitric oxide gas. And so I've copyrighted and trademarked this term. Uh, we own it and we make products that are nitraceuticals that are completely different than any other products on the market. Uh, and so any product that we bring to market, we can detect nitric oxide coming off of it. We see the physiological effects of nitric oxide. We can look at valid endpoints in terms of patients who take it. We can see normalization of blood pressure, improve in exercise performance, improve, improvement in cognition, blood flow throughout the body, improvement in endothelial function. Uh, everything that nitric oxide is known to do, we can actually quantify and detect that in the products that we develop. And then the other, the other major problem is, you know, beets, beets became a, a, a kind of a hero vegetable in 2012 in the Olympic Games in London, when it was realized that most of these Olympic athletes were drinking liters of beetroot juice because there was evidence that it would produce nitric oxide and then enhance their performance. Now the market is flooded with beet powders, beet gummies, beet chews. And I mean, it's, it would be humorous if it wasn't dangerous for the entire industry, because these products can't work. You cannot get nitric oxide in a gummy or a chew. And so there's nothing super about some of these beet products that are marketed on TV. Uh, in fact, it's, you know, it's outright fraud and it's deceiving the consumer and the customer. Uh, so what we do is we try to, and, and my motivation for this is, is, is authentic because it could kill the entire nitric oxide industry. And I hear this all the time when I go, well, I've, ta I've taken nitric oxide and it didn't seem to do anything for me. And I go, what do you mean? And I go, well, I took this beet powder that I saw advertised on TV or this beet gummy and it didn't do anything, but it's nitric oxide. And I go, no, what you, you didn't take nitric oxide. You took a product that was fraudulently marketed as a nitric oxide product. So when people come to me and say, hey, I've tried nitric oxide, didn't work, it's not that important. I go, what? No, no, no. You, this could kill an entire industry. And nitric oxide is so important for what we're doing in the history of medicine and the future of medicine that this cannot be allowed to happen. So we have to call these companies out. We have to demonstrate products that actually generate nitric oxide. Now, when they take our products, they actually see the effects. We can, we can support normal blood pressure. We can improve performance. And now when they take nitraceuticals or products that actually generate nitric oxide, now they see the effects. Now they got the aha moment and go, this is life-changing. So that's the point. And we have to call these companies out. We have to call a spade a spade. And, you know, 
some of these products contain certain nutrients that may be good nutrients, but they're not nitric oxide products. So stop calling them nitric oxide products. So would it be fair to say the big difference between what products you're making versus some of these others that are on the shelf at the supplement store that say a beet powder at the health food store would be more of a nitrate supplement where you'd need to still create nitric oxide in the body and yours is bypassing the endothelium and those other steps in creating nitric oxide final product in the body that it can use. Yeah, that would be the best case. What you talked about, the night, the beet powders being a, a source of nitrate. <clears throat> We've taken, I've tested hundreds of these beet powders and 99% of them don't contain any detectable amounts of nitrate or nitrite. So they're not even providing the precursors at a level that your body even could convert it. So these are dead beet products. In fact, we use them as placebos in our clinical trials. The only thing they do is turn your pee and your poop pink and cause a lot of anxiety. They do nothing in terms of nitric oxide. So what we do is completely different. And the whole the whole motivation for this was if your body can't make nitric oxide because you have endothelial dysfunction or because you're not getting enough nitrate or because you're using mouthwash or because you're using an acids, then we have to do it for you. Your body can't make it. It's clear. I can give you all the substrates precursors, but if your body can't convert it to nitric oxide, which is your problem, then you're not going to get a benefit from that. And I don't want to create a product that creates benefit for one in three people. I want to develop a product that's going to provide benefit to every single person that takes it, whether they're getting enough nitrate from their diet, whether they're using mouthwash or not, whether they're exposed to fluoride or not, or whether they're on an acid or not. So my product technology, when you take it, it generates nitric oxide for you. We're not dependent upon the conversion of nitrate. We're not dependent upon the oral bacteria. We're not dependent upon stomach acid production. We control and dictate the metabolic fate of the product technology that we put in your body. But more importantly, we fix the enzyme that makes nitric oxide in the lining of the blood vessel. We create a certain electrical potential in that product technology that recouples the NOS enzyme, prevents tetrahydrobopterin oxidation. Now we improve endothelial function. And oh, the other thing, by giving these bacteria on the crypts of the tongue a source of nitrogen in our lozenge, we're seeing that we, we can increase the diversity of the oral microbiome. We can increase the number of nitrate-reducing bacteria. So now we're improving the body's ability to make nitric oxide from both pathways. We're giving the body a source of nitric oxide, but we're actually improving the body's ability to make it on its own. So over time, theoretically, you would need less and less of my product over time because we were actually fixing the reason your body couldn't make it. So that's probably a poor economic model from a business standpoint, but it's a beautiful physiological model. And I'm more interested in maintaining the integrity of the science than I am in making a profit from selling products because we have to understand why people can't make nitric oxide and fix it. That's how the human body is designed to work. You went right where I was going to go next. The fact that taking a supplement like that, it gets me thinking about, is it something I need to take for life? And you, you addressed it sort of a little bit there. The fact that it's going to fix the physiology, at least to some extent, and have a long-term benefit. But have you guys done specific research where people have taken this for a period of time, stopped, and then say like a year later retested to see if the changes are lasting? Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to change people's habits, right? And humans are conditioned to, they want to fix, they want a simple fix. They want a pill they can swallow to overcome their bad habits, right? Nobody wants to change their diet and start exercising, right? So people are looking for a, for a silver bullet. And I'm going to tell you, nitric oxide is not a silver bullet. My products are not a silver bullet. That doesn't exist. So what we're finding, and I'm probably the best example. I've been doing this for 20 years, been taking my nitric oxide for, for about that long. And I take it every day. Not because I think I need it every day. It's because the world we live in is so toxic, right? The air we breathe. I'm on an airplane every week for the past five, six, seven years. Every week I'm on an airplane going somewhere, going into a hotel with a lot of EMFs, airports, you know, exposed to environmental pollutants and toxicants. And a lot of times I don't get to eat a very good diet. So I take it prophylactically to protect my body from the assault that I'm getting on a daily or weekly basis. So with that said, if we lived in utopia in a perfect world where we didn't have herbicides, pesticides, environmental toxins, the air we breathe was pure, then no, you would never need to supplement anything. And if the food we ate was replete in all the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients we needed, then you would never need to supplement and it would be true utopia. 
But unfortunately, that's not the world we live in. So I think what we're finding is a daily nitric oxide boost is, I think, fundamental to preventing this age-related loss. And I think the conversations need to be to, for people being proactive instead of reactive. Today, medicine is a reactive practice. Humans are reactive, right? We don't take action until we have a heart attack or stroke or, or something. We're driven by fear. We have to change that. We have to be proactive, do the things that we need to do to prevent our body from getting sick and developing these so-called fears of and, and having heart attacks and strokes because we know how to we know how to completely prevent that. So maybe that was a long-winded answer to your question, but I think if if you get moderate physical exercise which stimulates nitric oxide, you eat a good clean anti-inflammatory diet, and you get exposure to 20 30 minutes of sunlight a day and you restrict your exposure to things like fluoride, chlorine, things we're exposed to, then typically not. Your body is going to perform and do what it's designed to do. But very few people live in that in environment. I live out on 800 acres out in the middle of nowhere. We eat our own beef. We grow our own vegetables. The air we breathe is clean. We don't have fluoride in our water. we got a full filtration system. And I haven't been sick in more than 20 years. So, But, you know, I take care of myself. I exercise. I supplement with nitric oxide and a few other supplements that I'm typically not getting from my diet. So everybody's different and everybody has a different kind of objective and uh, you know, metabolic demand on what they're trying to achieve and what they're trying to do. So, you know, you have to personalize your own approach. As we're talking about supplements, it gets me thinking back to something we mentioned earlier, erectile dysfunction, which when we hear that, we all automatically think about Viagra and the blue pill. What I'd like you to do is compare the physiology of somebody taking that versus one of your supplements? Do they act in a similar way in the body? And is the Viagra just more powerful or decipher between the two? Now, look, everybody's familiar with, with the blue pill and these drugs were approved in <clears throat> 1998. So they've been on the market for 25 years. And these drugs are called phosphodiesterase inhibitors. So there's, there's a misconception in medicine by some really smart physicians that just understand the, the mechanism of action. But there, there's a misconception that these drugs are nitric oxide donors. These drugs are not nitric oxide donors. In fact, they're dependent upon nitric oxide production. So when I mentioned earlier when we started this, when nitric oxide is produced, <clears throat> it creates a second messenger called cyclic GMP. And that cyclic GMP is what leads to the calcium dependent smooth muscle relaxation and blood vessel dilation. And it's drugs like Viagra, the phosphodesterase inhibitors, that prevent the breakdown of cyclic GMP. So I tell people nitric oxide turns the switch on and then the Viagra keeps it on because it prevents the breakdown from cyclic GMP. And that's the reason you're warned against four-hour erections and unsafe drop in blood pressure. That's why you have all these side effects because now you've lost regulation. You've turned the switch on, but there's no off, right? You're continuing to have the cyclic GMP around because you're preventing the breakdown. But here's what we've also learned in 25 years. 50% of the men that are prescribed Viagra or Cialis or Levitra, the three main uh, branded drugs, don't respond with better erections. So why is that? If you're given a phosphodesterase inhibitor, why don't they dilate the blood vessels and improve erectile dysfunction? It's because in these non-responders, they're not able to make any nitric oxide to activate the second messenger cyclic GMP. So now there's no substrate for these drugs to work on. So what does that mean? Erectile dysfunction is a symptom of insufficient nitric oxide production. And now if you fix their nitric oxide with our technology or something else, now the non-responders to Viagra become responders. And the responders, you can actually titrate down the dose because they need less of the drug to optimize the effect. Because we're improving the underlying problem in these patients with EDs, we're improving their nitric oxide production and now allowing the signal cascade to do its job produce cyclic GMP, activate the enzymes, dilate the blood vessels, improve blood flow, improve erectile function, and then cyclic GMP is broken down. You gain regulation again, and you don't have a four-hour erection, but you can perform and then recover. And that's how the body's designed to work. And I want to tie this back to what we said earlier. The ED is a canary in a coal mine. And I'm sure for a lot of people, that's what brings people into this world and wanting solutions but if you're having a problem in that realm, 
it means you have a huge NO issue beyond ED and use this as a warning sign to get to the bottom of this and prevent hopefully quote unquote more serious issues such as a heart attack or stroke. Look, if you have in the female dysfunction in the vascular bed of the sex organ, right? That same, the, the conditions that allowed for endothelial dysfunction in the corpus cavernosum of the penis, for example, those conditions are going to cause endothelial dysfunction in the coronary arteries, the endothelium in the heart. So if you have endothelial dysfunction in the sex organs, you have endothelial dysfunction in the coronary arteries, you have endothelial dysfunction in the cerebral arteries, you have endothelial dysfunction in the pulmonary arteries, the liver, the kidneys, every organ in the body. So it's just kind of socially inconvenient that you're not able to regulate blood flow to the sex organs upon demand. But think about this. If you can't regulate blood flow to the heart upon demand and dilate the blood vessels when you start to exercise, you're going to get ischemia or anginum because you can't dilate the blood vessels. You're going to get chest pain, occlusion of the blood vessels, and heart attack. Or if it happens in the cerebral arteries, you're going to get a stroke. So this is really the canary in the coal mine, and it should be a warning signal for people that have erectile dysfunction that, hey, this isn't just a sexual problem. This isn't just a testosterone problem or an estrogen problem in women. This is a vascular problem, insufficient nitric oxide production, and it's systemic. It manifests in the sex organs first, but you have systemic disease, and it's called nitric oxide deficiency. You mentioned there the fact that it affects the sexual organs first. How long does that take? When somebody has ED, is this they've been having issues with NO for years, or do they catch it really quickly with that symptom? We well, you know the sex organs are pretty dynamic in the fact that you have to respond with an increase in, in vasodilation to a larger degree. I mean, probably, I mean, the coronary arteries are probably the most responsive because the only way to increase oxygen delivery to the heart to increase the metabolic demands on the heart when exercising is through vasodilation. In the heart, there's already 100% maximal oxygen extraction through normal blood flow. So to increase oxygen utilization and oxygen delivery, you got to dilate the blood vessels. In the sex organs, you know, there are a number of things that control vasoactivity. You know, you have hormone regulation. Uh, if you have low testosterone, obviously you're going to have some degree of erectile dysfunction. But you can have optimal testosterone, decreased nitric oxide production, and you're never going to get an optimal erection. So what we're finding is that there's a it's a spectrum, right? It's not just like a switch where one day you have good erectile function, the next day you have full-blown ED. It's a spectrum. So you start to develop slight erectile dysfunction, slight endothelial dysfunction. If not corrected and you're not changing your habits and improving your endothelial function, then it's just going to continue to get worse. One day you wake up and you're not going to be able to get an erection and that's full-blown ED. So I think with any disease process, we can if we catch it early on, we can certainly reverse it. And I think it's, we demonstrated this in, in erectile dysfunction or patients with mild cognitive disorders. If we catch it early in the process, restoring the thelial function, produce nitric oxide, then we can completely reverse that vascular dysfunction. And that's the goal is that we start to make people aware of signs and symptoms of nitric oxide deficiency, stop doing the things that are disrupting it, get off mouthwash, get rid of fluoride, stop using an acids, and start doing the things that promote it. Start exercising 20, 30 minutes a day get moderate physical uh, or sunlight 20, 30 minutes a day and throw in some more green leafy vegetables. That's pretty simple. And that actually saves people money. And then if all else fails or you want to kind of a biohack it, then we have product technology that does it for you. We've gone deep into the dietary piece and obviously that's foundational for all of this. But before we part ways, you've touched on exercise and sunlight a couple times and you gave a little bit of a description of what we'd want to do in those realms. But let's get more nuanced and talk about what the ideal dose would be, frequency, and what's happening with the physiology with those two specifically. Well, sunlight first. There's certain wavelengths of light. There's both on the on the UV side of the spectrum and the ultra or the uh, infrared. So these different wavelengths of light provide a certain frequency that will liberate nitric oxide bound to what we call photolabile stores, whether it's metals in the tissue or even cysteine thiols. So when we generate nitric oxide, as I mentioned, nitric oxide gas is gone, but it creates these second messengers. And then when we're exposed to sunlight, for instance, infrared light, that frequency will actually knock nitric oxide off of metals. 
So if nitric oxide is captured by a metal, it can liberate it, become vasoactive. That's why, you know, sunlight lowers blood pressure. You know, it, it does a lot of things. And then the UV side will actually cleave NO bound assisting thiols. So we have to have enough of these kind of photolabile stores of nitric oxide to be acted upon by the sunlight or infrared or certain wavelengths of light. So I tell people if you're using infrared light or an infrared sauna, dose up with nitric oxide prior to going out in the sunlight or getting an infrared sauna because we can actually improve the efficiency of light therapy. And then in exercise, you know, we need oxygen to make nitric oxide and we need nitric oxide to deliver oxygen. When we exercise, we reach an anaerobic threshold where we run out of oxygen so the body is no longer able to produce nitric oxide. But if we titrate up with nitric oxide first, we create a buffer or a reservoir that when we run out of oxygen, now we have a kind of a reservoir of nitric oxide that pushes the oxygen gradient, extends the anaerobic threshold, and improves performance. So they're both, even if you don't titrate up, then exercise has been shown to stimulate and activate nitric oxide production. Because what happens is that tissue is running out of oxygen and going, hey, I need, I need to adapt to this exercise because I don't want to run out of oxygen again. And the body responds by creating more blood vessels called angiogenesis, generating more nitric oxide. Nitric oxide improves mitochondrial biogenesis. So now the cell has more mitochondria, generating more ATP more efficiently with less oxygen. So that's the adaptive effects of exercise and the adaptive effects of nitric oxide production. So loading, I think what we do is, and I mentioned this earlier, if you're, if you're like us, Jesse, we're relatively young and healthy and don't have any disease or symptoms, then the dosing and the metabolic demands on us are much different than somebody that's, you know, 60 with high blood pressure, ED, and diabetes. So for us, usually one, one dose a day of our lozenge or our, our nitric oxide beets product uh, before a workout. Uh, and we develop this to kind of titrate in what's called restorative physiology, give the body what's missing. So obviously somebody who's 50 or 60 with diabetes, ED, high blood pressure, they're going to need a much higher dose or much different dose than what you and I are requiring. So for those, I say one lozenge every, you know, six, eight, 10 hours, depending on the individual to start with. That's kind of the loading dose. And then, you know, your body's going to respond and kind of reset the rheostat, if you will. And then you can kind of lower the dose and just be on a maintenance dose. But everybody's different. And, you know, you just have to kind of self-titrate in and, and pay attention to your body. When it comes to the lozenges or the beet powder, what are the biggest symptom differences people report when they start taking those? Yeah, you know, it's always, I mean, there's three things, better blood pressure, better erectile function, and better sleep. Uh, and those those are three big <clears throat> big ones. I mean, most people don't get enough sleep. Uh, ED, 50% of the men over the age of 40 self-report some type of erectile dysfunction. And then blood pressure. Two out of three Americans have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure. And many people are looking for natural remedies for blood pressure. So those are the big three for the lozenge. The, the NO beets, which is our fermented beet powder, we pre-convert it. We take the oxalates out. So it's a, it's a beet powder, but it's white. Uh, no beet pulp, no beet crystals, no oxalates, and no beet taste. Uh, we use that as an energy source or a pre-workout. We've seen an enormous improvement in exercise efficiency. Um, the perceived exertion of an exercise regimen is much less. And then just more energy. I mean, you can take it in the afternoon, and we really position this to be a replacement for things like Red Bull, Monster Energy, 5-Hour Energy, these stimulant-ridden, really dangerous energy drinks that people are, are drinking. So why not take a natural source of energy that repletes the body of nitric oxide, improves circulation, and improves energy naturally? I mean, that's the beauty of, of these products. And if somebody tuning in right now wants to give one of them a try, we have a discount. I think it's a discount code we'll put in the show notes so people can access that. So thank you for that. And I just want to thank you for coming on the show. This was super informative. We went into a lot of detail and I learned a lot. I'm sure the audience did as well. And I just appreciate the work you're doing, Nathan. Thank you. Well, Jesse, thank you. I mean, it's look, nothing we do would ever mean anything if we can't get it out to the masses. And I think that's what you do is so important because now we can speak directly to the masses and and cover really the tough biochemistry and physiology, but hopefully put it in a in a way that's easily digestible, but most importantly, that it's practical. And you can, from the moment you get up from watching this, you can start making changes and just stop doing the things that disrupt nitric oxide production and start doing the things that promote it and your body will thank you for it. 
Yeah, there's a lot of powerful inputs. That's what I love about this conversation that people can implement right away and and see changes. And Nathan, one last thing we'll end on here. The fact that you've been in this world for so long, you've done so much research and you have this lineup of products, you've written books. What's next for you? You mentioned you're still relatively young and healthy. You got a lot of years ahead of you and you've done all this work. Where are you going next? Well, I hope I have many years ahead of me. You know, we never know, right? (laughs) But you know, I think what excites me every day is getting up as we have a, a drug discovery program. I've got a drug company called Bryan Therapeutics. We're developing nitric oxide drugs. We've got drugs in, in clinical trials for ischemic heart disease. We've got a drug for Alzheimer's. We've got a topical drug for diabetic ulcers and non-healing wounds. Um, and I see this as really the way we treat patients for the next hundred years. So there's really not an indication that would not be affected or improved by nitric oxide at the right dose, at the right time, and the right patient. And that's the that's the objective and mission of our drug company is to bring safe and effective nitric oxide drugs to the market for every major health indication there is out there. So that's exciting. I've got a new book coming out probably in um, late fall, early winter called The Secret of Nitric Oxide, uh, picked up by a major publisher. So we should have that out hopefully um, in the winter at the latest. But it, it it's really to try to build awareness and education on nitric oxide It's partly autobiographical, talking about the discoveries we made from 20, 25 years ago and how we've seen this into the translation of safe and effective nitric oxide product technology. But more importantly, it's to hopefully teach and get people to understand the importance of nitric oxide and what they can do to take control of their own health and be proactive and not reactive. All right. Like I mentioned before, we're going to link up the discount code. We're going to link up your books and your research, everything in the show notes. And I just want to thank you again for coming on the show. This has been great. Thank you, Jesse. I appreciate you. Now that you're finished, Nathan, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dr. Lou. He won a Nobel Prize for his work in nitric oxide. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. And then I realized that I was awarded the Nobel Prize. I just want the world to realize how important.